Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, my guest today says we often take for granted the wildlife we have in our country and how it came to be protected. And he says if we're not all involved in conservation, we could lose what we have. A conversation with hunter philosopher Shane Mahoney next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. My guest today says the, that to participate in the conservation and protection of wildlife is a critical act of citizenship. Shane Mahoney is a wildlife biologist who speaks all over the world about conservation. A Canadian by birth, Mahoney is the Executive Director of Sustainable Development and Strategic Science for the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador. His scientific research has focused on the population dynamics of large mammals and on predator-prey interactions, but he's perhaps best known for his articles, films, and speeches about the importance of conservation. Outdoor Canada magazine named him one of the 10 most influential conservationists in Canada, and Outdoor Life magazine has nominated Mahoney for Person of the Year. He's in Boise to address the North American Wildlife Enforcement Officers Association. Those are the fish and game officers from the United States and Canada. And in 2012, he was the keynote speaker at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game's Wildlife Summit. Welcome back to Idaho. Well, thank you very much. You must like I, it. You keep coming I back. I do, I do. I like it very much. What's well, not to like? Right. Well, one of the reasons that people live here is because of the diversity of wildlife. And um, sometimes it's hard to see whether there are any problems at all because it all looks so beautiful here. But your contention is um, if we're not careful, we could lose what we have, as I said in my introduction, all of the abundance that we see around us. Well, I think it's uh, generally true that uh, the things that we value most in life and the things that are most precious to us uh, always are in need of protection and vigilance. Um, I think in the case of wildlife, the, the, the history of humankind's engagements with it have given us plenty to reflect on and to realize that it is very easy for things to get out of balance. Uh, the, the rise of the conservation movement itself, in fact, was born in this country and in other countries of the world out of crisis and over-exploitation. Um, we see today, uh, you know, a, a virtual kaleidoscope of challenges facing wildlife from energy development to, uh, you know, requirements for agriculture to the demands that people wish to place on the environment generally. Um, you know, there's nothing that says that the natural wealth of a nation will last forever unless it is protected in some way. And your contention is that we need to broaden the base for that protection. I mean, traditionally, at least in Idaho, Hunters and anglers have been the ones that pay through their licenses to um, have the fish and game department. Yes. But there's, there's, there's talk now, and the Wildlife Summit in 2012 um, generated this, about broadening that base and having people who may not hunt also contribute into the system, also have a, a, a stake in it. Do you well, support that? I do, of course, because um, wildlife, first of all, is a public trust resource. It belongs to all the people. It is not... Uh, it is not simply something that is there for the enjoyment of people who may wish to fish and hunt, although history is very clear that people who have uh, hunted and fished have made tremendous contributions to the conservation of wildlife. But it is a public trust resource. It belongs to everyone. And it not only belongs to the generation of today, it belongs to the generations of tomorrow and those to follow after that. So it, it is, uh, therefore, uh, the right of all people to feel that they should have access to it. But with that comes uh, responsibility, I believe. And I believe that all people should be making a contribution for the conservation of, of nature. Through their tax money, through purchases at various stores. How does it work in Canada? Well, it's a different system in Canada because there, uh, most of the funding that come to provincial agencies, for example, come from general revenue. Uh, from taxes. The, yeah, from taxes. So the monies are not dedicated in the sense that, you know, license fees for hunting and fishing licenses go directly to the agency. So do, you like, a, do you like that system better than the one that we have that puts 
puts it all with the hunters? Well, I think that the systems are different, and each has its own strengths and weaknesses. I mean, the, the strength of the American system is that there's a very dedicated source of funding that people can predictably rely on pretty much. Uh, they know the trends in, in sales, et cetera, so they will have a, a strong sense of what the uh, resources available to them will be. And Canada is a little less predictable in that sense in that it's open to the many complex decisions that governments must make about the allocations of funding. I would say that uh, as both countries have done in the past, it is worthwhile to examine the models each has and to borrow from the strengths of each and to try and whittle away at the weaknesses as best we can. In Idaho, there's been a bit of antipathy or m more than a bit of <laughs> antipathy between hunters and other mm. conservationists. And, um, with some saying, no, we, we, don't, we don't want to broaden the base because then the non-hunters will have more say in how the fish and game money is used. What's your sense about um, the need for the groups to come together and work on this and how, how that might happen, how they can do that? Because there, there is a lot of you know, distance between the two of them sometimes. Well, I think you know, it's, it's true, but I think if we reflect on the dynamics and dialogue that occur in society and almost any issue, there's, there's always a diversity of views and a sense of tension around justice, uh, around freedom, about the right to bear arms, around uh, how we allocate money for educational processes. So I think there has been uh, a certain amount of tension here. Um, but, you know, historically the conservation movement gained its strength from the fact that it was broadly based many people forget the fact that there were far more than hunters and anglers involved in conservation. This is not to diminish the contribution they've made, but as a hunter and as an angler, I know that many, many people who do not hunt and fish are also very concerned about the environment and also very concerned about conservation. I think it is natural for a group that has given so much, uh, that sees monies that they themselves spend being directly used for conservation to feel, uh, that they may be a little threatened by a broadening of the base and they wonder what does that mean for the cherished traditions they have. I think this is an understandable human reaction. But I think the long arc uh, of time and thought would reveal that we must have this broader coalition of people working for wildlife. The challenges that wildlife will face in the 21st century are enormous. They're enormous everywhere. And they're going to be enormous in this state. No place will escape it. And to think that, you know, a percentage of people, a very small percentage, can alone uh, carry the freight for all that's going to be required for this process is just, uh, it's, it's just not tenable. Well, you have an example in your own province of the vast cod fisheries that used to exist that, you know, became yeah, I mean, overfished and, you know, it was, it was taken for granted that there was a cod and Newfoundland were tied together and then it was gone. Yes, and I mean, I think this is an illustration, and there are many of them around the world. This happens to be, you know, a very personal one for me because I, I'm from there and I lived through it and I saw what it did. You know, we're all dependent on the natural world. There is no escaping this phenomenon. Uh, it's a biological reality. And um, we come to realize when these resources that we rely on are lost or severely diminished, just how significant the human impact can be. And it takes a toll on a culture and on a society. It makes a measurable difference in the quality of life. And this is why people are so naturally protective of, of these things. They want those opportunities to be maintained. But what sometimes we fail to realize is that it's only through thoughtful, strategic, coordinated action between all levels in society, including political elites and business elites, that we actually manage to safeguard these resources. We only have one planet, and as far as we know, good planets are very hard to find. So uh, some of the species that we're talking about, though, are kind of controversial, <laughs> mm -hmm. like wolves. Yes. So we, the people want to protect elk, yes. which are an icon iconic species here. Of course. Others want to protect wolves, which used to be here mm -hmm. and have been um, transplanted here, brought back in. and. Um, so much acrimony over this topic in Idaho that uh, they were reintroduced they're off the endangered species list now and now people are worried they're going to be hunted down mm -hmm. again. So it's not always as easy to talk about these species as, you know, cod. 
No, I mean I think the the, the wolf issue is a is a incredibly important one for many 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 reasons. Uh, to step back a little bit on this debate, uh, you know, we need to realize that one of the greatest contributions to human progress, in my view, that has ever been made was the invention of this idea of conservation, that we could live within the natural world and yet we could maintain the diversity of it. And this is, this is the United States of America made an enormous contribution to this intellectual movement. Um, and I think one of the great achievements of the North American approach has been that we have been able to maintain these big carnivores. We have not eliminated them. We still have the mountain lion. We still have the wolf. We still have the grizzly bear. These are, these are extraordinary achievements for the 21st century and that we still have them. Secondly, we have to realize that we went through a long period of reducing predators, and making great efforts to reduce their numbers for long periods of time. Uh, to protect various other uh, elements in our society that we valued. And this allowed wildlife populations, game populations, if you will, uh, to do very well because it, they existed in the absence of these big predators. So naturally, when you bring them back, whatever the motivation, whatever the design, when you bring them back, they are bound to make a difference. Um, the real challenge is to try and find uh, a sense of balance in this. Should big carnivores uh, be managed as other wildlife populations are? Absolutely they should. Should we be encouraging uh, large populations of big carnivores that are potentially dangerous in the environs of, you know, where a lot of people are? I think that's a, a recipe for disaster. But on the other hand, I think to be able to recognize that we still have landscapes so vibrant and full of life that we can maintain these big carnivores is something that every American and Canadian citizen ought to be proud of. Hunters will of course realize that the take that these carnivores assume is theirs from these prey populations will conflict to some extent with the opportunities to hunt. That's real and it's going to be more real in some places than it is in others. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that as long as we are able to provide abundant opportunity for hunting as well as opportunity for people to see all kinds of wildlife in their natural environment, we can all feel a measure of success in this regard. The, the removal uh, of, of animals from the endangered species listing and the opportunities for states to manage them, I think this is a good thing, frankly. Do you have a concern that then once there's hunting again, that they'll, their numbers will plummet? I, I think th this is another uh, very important point. Um, there's very, very little evidence to indicate that uh, normal, lawful, you know, hunting as we understand it uh, has ever been able to significantly diminish the number of wolves. Where we have been successful, if you wish to use that term, in uh, diminishing their numbers very significantly, it has been by taking extraordinary means. And in the past, that has included all kinds of things, uh, from poisoning animals to shooting them from aircraft to doing, you know. Which but does happen. The federal government does come in. And it still does happen, uh, you know, and I, I don't think it's a... I don't think it's something that, uh, you know, a broad majority of people want to see us to resort to. If we can have a management of the carnivore populations with kind of lawful, legal access, uh, hunting access, and then I think the majority of people would certainly prefer to see that, and so would I. But I think we have to recognize that the risk, if you will, that wolf numbers will be uh, very seriously depleted as a result of normal recreational legal hunting activity is extremely low. I want to get back to your point about uh, conservation as an act of citizenship, which I mentioned in the introduction and that it needs to rise even higher on politicians' agendas as well. Mm. So let's first talk about why you believe that conserving animal species is a critical act of belonging to a country or an act of citizenship in a country. Well, first of all, I think that um, we have, um, you know, out of a sense of our own preservation, uh, we need to recognize that we rely fundamentally on the natural world and we have no replacement for this. Um, secondly, I think we 
all. Although they're starting to clone animals. So. They're starting to clone <laughs> animals, but even that is using natural material, obviously, that was provided. But I guess the point is that we also recognize that wildlife is something that uh, really exists as a barometer of the conditions in the natural world. You cannot have abundant wildlife. You cannot have abundant fish populations. You cannot have these things, this wild beauty and this wild abundance, unless the natural environment itself is, is sustaining and healthy. And so from that perspective, wildlife give us the quickest you know, snapshot of whether or not those environments are resilient. Um, so I think from those perspectives, it is critically important that people view uh, one of their responsibilities as ensuring that that natural environment is maintained. But even beyond that, it is my contention that wild animals taught us to be human. They were our original inspirations for art. Uh, you know, the, the cave art uh, is a, and the earliest sculptures are clear indications of where we sought our few first uh, inspirations of beauty, and they came from animals. Uh, the very ideas of our relationships with them were deeply embedded in all of our mythologies. They have strongly influenced us through time in, in any number of ways, and they still represent um, creatures that we recognize share a great deal with us. And that is part of the reason why we are so intrigued uh, by them, so mesmerized by them. I've often said that you could give me 50 children from 50 nations and put them in a room with the greatest toys ever invented, but bring one wild creature into their midst, and every single one of those children will immediately turn their attention to that wild creature. Yes. This, is a, this, is a, I mean, this is a truth that we, that we cannot escape. And therefore, if we want our children uh, to have a sense of the balance of life and the diversity of life and just how extraordinary this world can be, surely we must feel that to keep these wild others with us is part of the responsibilities we have as parents and as citizens. You have said indeed that animals have taught us to be human. Yes, I think they did. I think you know, one of the great experiences of my life has been visiting the, the, the cave art sites in, in, in Spain in particular. And um, in much of that art, uh, some of which was carried out intermittently over a 30,000 year period, which is quite a long time, um, you know, you see these creations which we call theriomorphs, which are half human and half animal. You know, my own personal interpretation of these is, is very clear that at some point early man, you know, struggled with this idea of where the separation was between his life and the animals on which he depended, which he hunted in, in order to survive. And this amalgam of animal man uh, really, I think, was a struggle to define the differences between ourselves and them. Um, and I think it was in finding that difference that we realized that uh, our humanness did carry something different. What do you think of zoos in general? Um, I think they, they can play a, a very important uh, role in at least two ways. One is it is incredibly important that all people be able to maintain some contact with wild animals and to see in, in real life uh, animals that they may never have a chance to see otherwise. Even if they're species. caged? Or Even if they are caged. I think the second uh, uh, value of zoos, of course, is that they can be, as breeding facilities, very important from a conservation perspective. I think that, um, you know, they cannot be expected uh, to give us the view of the wild others in the same way as if we experience them in their own habitats. But I do think, while at some times it is difficult to see them under such confinement, um, I still think it is a valuable exercise for people to be able to at least spend some time and see some aspect of animal behavior that they would not otherwise be able to witness. Because there are many, many people around the world who don't see any wildlife anymore. I mean, yeah. to talk about the, the, some of the threats that the wild other, as you put it, are facing in other parts of the world where these conservation efforts have not taken hold? You know, it's a, it's a very important question because we debate issues intensively and rightfully so here in North America, whether it's the, you know, the wolf issue or the Endangered Species Act or, 
whether people should continue to hunt and fish or whatever the debate may be, we ought to stand back and reflect on just how absolutely blessed we are to be able to even have those debates. You know, there are billions, literally billions of people in this world today who from the time they are born until the time they die will never have a single experience in viewing a piece of wild, beautiful country or a wild animal. Billions of people, a huge percentage of the entire human race will never have a single moment of that experience. And so you look at other parts of the world and you realize that the debate is not over whether you know we have big carnivores and they take some percentage of a population of a particular species, but the reality is that the vast majority of the people in that region must eat those wildlife every single day just to survive. And the conservation challenge is, is not one of policy debate, but it's one of the reality of life or death for people. And the challenge of conservation, therefore, becomes escalated to those kinds of stark realities. What, what choice do we make? Do we make a choice between people and another wild creature? Or uh, they're taking the horn uh, of um, an animal and uh, selling it, not getting much money, yeah. but doing it to survive. How, how, do you, how do you get those people to care when their very sustenance, livelihood, depends on destroying the destruction of the wildlife? It's a or long, they perceive it does. It's a long road, of course, and there's no magic solution to simply go in as a well-wisher and suddenly, you know, recreate the culture and the environment and the world. And, and secondly, we have to realize that uh, every one of these nations of the world and they have their own culture, they have their own narrative, they have their own history, they have their own expectations. Um, are you pleased with what the international unions are doing? on these issues, the, you know, and, and the, the laws, are they stringent enough, you know, for instance, on poaching uh, and on importation of these things? Well, uh, well it, it's a question of whether law will work. I mean, the law is very stringent in some cases. In the case of poaching of rhino horn and elephants and other uh, animals, for that matter, in some countries, uh, you know, armed patrols shoot to kill, and they kill human beings who are poaching those animals. Um, so one would have to say that's a pretty strict law. Uh, but the question is, what's the solution? And surely the solution has to be that we must find a way for the local indigenous peoples to benefit from wildlife in such a way that they see that there is a conservation value in them. Such as Idaho and Greg Carr is doing in Mozambique. Exactly. This is a classic case, or the Friedkin Foundation is doing in a number of uh, countries in, in Africa, and, and which in many African uh, countries themselves are, 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 are launching their own programs. But we we need to reflect on these international challenges because our own debates constantly need a sense of moderation if we are to find the most successful ways to conserve wildlife in North America. And a first step in that regard is to realize the scale of our problems and also the incredible scale of our successes over the last 125 years. It could have been different. We could be sitting here today with no elk. We could be sitting here today with absolutely no mountain sheep. We could be sitting here today with absolutely no pronghorn, no grizzly bear, no whitetail, no mule deer. And that's where we were headed. And it was a tough fight to get that done. It was extraordinarily difficult. I mean, people look back on the long you know, narrative of history, and, and it seems that the people who had successes had successes because it, you know, it was easy, or they were especially gifted. Or, or everyone thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah, they, they it didn't. was not the case. When, when the conservation movement in North America was launched and the idea of, of restraint uh, being put in place, uh, huge economic forces and political forces were arraigned against those philosophies. And the fact that conservation succeeded and that we now, generations later, are the beneficiaries of this wildlife legacy is, is a testament not to the ease of success, but is a testament to the passion and commitment and drive and determination of the leaders of conservation in this country 120 years ago. So again, you have said that you're most concerned not about the people who are, have passion for this issue on both sides, you know, maybe the people that are arguing over, over wolves because they care, yes. at least they care. Yes. Your, your concern is for the people that are apathetic, of the, course. That, that don't care at all. Yeah. And um, 
what are the strategies for reaching them, for making them care, for having them understand uh, the value of wildlife in their world? If they can go to a zoo and see it or, or whatever, they've got other troubles in their lives. They do, and, uh, but I think that, you know, uh, first of all, it is a good thing that we have a diversity of views with respect to the lives and deaths of wild creatures. Um, I don't have any difficulty at all understanding why some people uh, cannot understand hunting. I, I don't have any difficulty with, with that whatsoever. Uh, and I believe that people who are opposed to hunting can be strong conservationists, just like people who hunt can be. But I do believe that the small percentages on both sides of the intense debate over the use of animals, for example, um, it is too small a fraction for us to be able to conserve wildlife in the long term. We need this broad middle group of people who are, generally speaking, you, not engaged. you reach them how? And you reach them by, first of all, making sure that the dialogue becomes public. You cannot simply have this dialogue occurring within the vested interest groups, whether it's a group on you know, one side of the chasm or, or on another. The public dialogue on wildlife, the value of wildlife, and the value of these natural resources, the very idea that beauty resides in the natural world, and that we can only go a short ways to recreating it with the best of our artists, that that m matters and should matter to people only by exposing them to this and by bringing them and making them part of the dialogue through public lectures, through television shows, through magazine articles, through radio uh, uh, shows and debates, only by bringing the message to people can you expect them to care. Do you believe that the wildlife itself, that animals f are sentient, that they feel pain, that they know? Um, of course they do. Of course they are. I had a, I mean, I, I, you know, I've been in many circumstances. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a hunter and a, and a fisherman, and I support hunting very much, as, as a lot of people know. But I also firmly believe, know, absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that those wild others are built as we are. And for anyone to suggest that they do not uh, feel pain or have intelligence or can do extraordinary things is just simply ridiculous. We only have a minute left. The time goes so quickly. As we wrap up, could you explain why you moved from the arena that you were in, which was, you know, science, scientific research, into the advocacy role? Why was it so important for you to, to have that transformation and do what you do today? You know, I, I'd like to tell you that, you know, I sat back one day and thought I should do all this, but it would be a lie. Um, I was drawn into it simply because I care deeply and one conversation led to another. I still do uh, a good deal of science. I still publish regularly and so on. But I'll tell you something. Science alone are not going to keep these wild animals with us. What we need are for the people in the state of Idaho, all people, in agriculture, in banking, in, in wildlife agencies, in service industries, to get together and to work on behalf of this extraordinary place and this extraordinary resource. The people in this state ought to realize you have an absolute paradise in which you live, but you have to work to keep it. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. You've been listening to conservationist Shane Mahoney. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.